Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today's coffee break, which is on the SCOM Clinic. We'll be tackling your common SCOM issues and uh, hopefully giving you some sensible solutions. Uh, so let's dig in. Uh, first thing I would normally say at the beginning of each of these coffee breaks is the conversation continues on Slack and to invite you all to, to join our Slack workspace. But today there is a global Slack outage, so I'm not going to be asking you to do that. Uh, today I'm going to be asking you if you have any questions for our panelists today to put them into the chat box in the Q&A box in GoToWebinar and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, also, we got a whole bunch of questions for this session ahead of, of the event itself, uh, so we'll be going through those over the course of today's webinar. All right, let's kick off then. Firstly, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Bruce Cullen. I'm the Director of Products here at Cokedown and I'll be your host for today's Coffee Break webinar. Um, but it's not really me you're here for. You're here for our awesome guests, starting with Bob. Hello, Bob. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Good. It's good to have you here with us again for another uh, webinar. Bob, you are an MVP and the Managing Consultant of Topcore. Good to have you with us. I am. All right. Uh, also, we have with us uh, Nathan Foreman. Nathan, you are a product architect, uh, also working with me here at Cookdown. Hello, Nathan. How are you? Hello. Doing good. Glad to be here. It's fun stuff to cover. Always fun stuff to cover. There's always uh, sort of practical issues when it comes to any technology. Uh, so uh, good to have you guys on hand so people can get their questions answered. So with that in mind, um, the SCOM doctors will see you now. Um, there will be a few chances kind of throughout today's webinar for you to uh, give us your questions live. If you've submitted a question ahead uh, of, of, of being live now in the registration form, they're in my slide deck and we'll be coming to them over the course of today's webinar. But if you didn't submit a question uh, and you have one to hand now, feel free to put it into the chat window or the Q&A window. Um, and we will we will address those straight off the bat before digging into the questions that have come in. Uh, if at any point something comes to mind um, that you want to say over the course of the webinar, there's also a slot for us to check in at the end. So don't feel this is your only opportunity, just your first opportunity. So I'll give it a moment. Um, and what, what are you guys expecting to see as far as the questions are concerned? I guess there are common things that come up time and time again. Yeah, I'll, and I guess the, I'd expect to see some just on maintainability, a lot of stuff. You know, what do you expect from the database? You know, how much how much is stored there? That kind of stuff. I'd expect to see some of those. Yes, makes sense. So maybe some on infrastructure or maybe on you know some things that which are broken or how to how to do something. Those are quite common, I think. So let's see what we get. Makes sense. Makes sense. So there is there is a question in the in the uh, Q and A box already, uh, which is what are the daily, weekly, and monthly checks which you do in your SCOM environment? That one's from George. Guys, what do you think? Well, actually, there are a number of things which you should regularly do as an administrator, and I actually do cover that in a course as well. But you know, there are things that have to do with the data volume that you are created and the volume of alerts that are created because they basically define how fast SCOM is working, but also how much problems you are having either in the environment or just looking at SCOM or your ticketing system. So all of that is let's say something which is like really weekly at least. And of course your daily checks are things having to do with the health of SCOM itself, the SCOM mm. infrastructure, the agents, I'll see yeah, how I, all of that is performing. Make sure to include in there, um, probably in the daily, if not daily, then get it weekly to make sure your all management servers resource pool and other key resource pools are online and healthy. Those mm -hmm. run a lot of the internal uh, key processes for SCAM. And if those go offline or are failing back and forth between management servers, things are just not going to work like you're hoping. Mm, yes. There's a question that alludes to that later on, which is uh, is interesting. Yeah, no uh, mm. no no SCOM management uh, resource pool health, then no dice essentially. <laughs> yes. Yes. Anything else to add? Because the questions are coming in thick and fast. And if not, 
Question number two, uh, turning down unwanted or unneeded rules and monitors is what it says. Essentially, uh, tricks and tips for tuning SCOM. So we'll we'll cover later some of the implementation steps, you know, some of the cook down stuff. But as for what to tune, I think it's best to talk to your specific um, recipients of alerts. You could always search online for a hundred different suggestions, but every company is going to be slightly different. And yeah. people also love to be heard if you can set up a meeting with someone that may be receiving half a dozen alerts and get their feedback. You may get a lot more traction than just picking what someone has done in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I would say Agreed. from my conversations with uh, people on one of our cheating solutions that I'm not going to talk about right now, it comes down to basically what uh, the best way to engage people is to talk to them, figure out what they need, what they actually care about um, seeing alerts for. And if they don't care about seeing alerts, then to tune them down. Uh, no individual tool, any one tool is going to help with those recommendations because they're so, you know, shop and individual specific. There are no one size fits all rules in my my experience. Um, Bob, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so what I usually do is I use uh, some reporting to check out, you know, which workflows are generating either the most data, so simply volume, let's say, data volume, and others which are creating most of the, let's say, mess in SCOM, so health uh, changes, state changes, um, of discoveries, of course, alerts are quite clear to most. However, there are also alerts which open and close during the night, which you might not even see if you're not automatically forwarding it into your ticketing system. There might be twice as many as you thought. So yeah. um, those are also very interesting to look at. And uh, I, there's the age old question that's like, again, often shop specific about, do you care about those alerts that have opened and closed in the night? Uh, some co some companies do, some don't, some should where they don't, etc. Yeah. Especially when you forward them into a notification channel. So usually I do put like a two or three minute hold on that. So if it opens and closes within two minutes, then it will not basically not even send it through the email. Yeah, it's, makes uh, sense. Keeping things a little bit more clear. Flapping alerts, the joy of flapping alerts. Sounds good. Next question on the list. Uh, general advice on upgrading from SCON 2012 R2 to 2019. Um, is loosely the next one. Do you have any general advice for upgrading for SCON 2012 R2 to 2019? Oh, yes. Several, yeah, actually. Sure. Well, are you, are you so, yeah, Bob, Bob's probably a good one. He's talked to lots of different companies. And... Yeah, I actually had several webinars about this one as well. But, you know, keep in mind that uh, the, the SCON in-place upgrade path is just one version up every time. And as you know, there's a 2016 version in the middle of that. So it actually requires multiple upgrades and also having to look at the supported Windows and SQL versions yeah. that you're running your SCOM infrastructure on. So at some point, the step might become so big and so many steps in between that you would just figure, let's just uh, do a side-by-side -side migration. So spin up a very completely new SCOM on the newest version and then move everything across. That is, uh, you know, the very, very short version of uh, of an answer to this question. But yeah. yeah, I would say just also have a look at those webinars. And yes, uh, I will be creating a new webinar for the move to SCOM 2022 as well in the coming well, two months, probably. Mm hmm. Yes, SCOM 2022. Looking forward to hearing more about that. I, I have not yet seen details on sort of the platforms, but even if we have, we wouldn't be allowed to talk about it because we're always on to secrecy on that stuff. Um, yes. But one thing I would say on SCOM 2022 is keep an eye on SCOMathon because we have some interesting webinars coming up soon. Um, moving on, uh, can we do SNMP monitoring for the network devices in SCOM or is there a limitation I should know about is the next question. SCOM supports SNMP. I guess I don't know. That seems like a question, like someone's trying to do something extremely broad and have hit a wall, but I know SCOM supports it. You can walk the OIDs for discovery as well as for monitoring a value to say, you know, value at OID, something, something, something should always be below 50. If it goes above 50, uh, it can do that. Um, Last I checked, I think it does V2 and V3 authentication, but the V3 might be yes. weaker than the traditional V2. 
but I, mm -hmm. it's been a while mm -hmm. since I've used SNMP. Yeah, you can you can do both uh, V2 and V3. Yeah, perfect. Works fine. I, I, I'm I'm aware there are limitations, but I'm not aware of what those limitations are. And that's through the the big SCOM survey. Um, one of the questions in there is, what would you most like to see added to SCOM? And there, are, it's usually in the top five, top ten. S uh, feedback relating to network monitoring and SNMP specifically make it better but it's sort of more generic than specific things the other um, the other one that comes back is it's not extremely intuitive to create an SNMP discovery I mean just OIDs in general anyone that's that's tried to go down that road it's just kind of a, a muddy mess and figuring out what what OIDs are where and what they should be and what values but SCOM mm -hmm. does support it once you get it coded up Yes. Makes sense. So some some things it picks up automatically already from the start, and some other types of devices you need to do some work yourself if you want to go deeper into that monitoring, and then you need to figure out which OIDs you really want to know about, and how to get it into a management pack, and there are some ways and methods for that one as well, which would mm -hmm. go maybe a little bit too deep right now, but uh, yeah they are there. Makes sense. A final point I'll add for moving on here is that um, SCOM is great for some things, but not for everything. I think it's widely recognized SCOM is not the best to breed monitoring tool for network monitoring. Now, I understand that sometimes there is no choice. It's the tool you have, and therefore it's the only tool you've got. But if you have other options for network monitoring, uh, you, you may be better served by using those for network monitoring and looking more at a single pane of glass to pull data from multiple systems together or integrating your monitoring tools together so you have a single kind of portal or view to see all the stuff from all your different monitoring tools in. Um, moving on to the next question, I'm going to uh, read this one. Uh, can our SCOM SSRS run on SQL Server 2019 while our SCOM DB runs on, C on 2016 SP3? Well, that may yes. be a question. We... Yes. Okay. Simple answer. Great. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, what's next? Oh, this one's big. I'm going to have to expand the box in the, ch the chat window box to get this whole question on my screen at once. Uh, having oh. trouble with subscriptions. I would like to create one subscription to. Oh, where's it gone? The UI does not work and go to webinar on a 4K screen very well. That's one thing I'll say. Let's drag it over here. There we go. Um, I would like to create one subscription to notify on multiple monitors and rules. However, the rules I oh gosh, it's scrolling everywhere. Uh, I don't know. However, the rules I would like to notify for new state rules alerts, not closed state rule alerts. Any recommendations for the subscription query to make this work right? Well, that's a question from Tyler. Yeah, you can actually select which states uh, you are going to alert or, or notify actually on. So there's a filter for the states as well. So you can do both, for example, new and closed. So you can actually see that, you know, you had some alert before, but it already got closed. So you don't need to worry about it that much. Uh, or you can just send only everything which was in new state at the moment that it got sent to you. That's uh, That is possible. Makes sense. Indeed, just the straightforward criteria builder does allow you to filter on state. Yeah, yeah, that answers yes. your question. It's a relatively simple one, hopefully. And then the final question in, in GoToWebinar, before we move on to the ones that you guys sent ahead of time, is uh, S another one on SNMP. SNMP using MIBS, is it required to use a separate monitoring account? Is the question. Uh, well, the, well, yeah, yes. Because SNMP always has some authentication, right? So it's either going to be a read-only string, V1 or V2, or it's going to be in V3 an account and a password. But yeah, it's it always is authenticated. But as long as it's a read-only string, that's that's sufficient. Then I'll just Perfect. work. And if they're worried about like a separate Windows account to run the workflows under or something, you won't you won't need that. But you will need a run as account for. Yeah, a community string or a V3 account. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. Sounds good. Straightforward answers. Good stuff. Uh, next one on the list then. Uh, and this is, I think, the, currently the final one in the list of questions. Another one just popped in. Um, is there anything I need to know about when installing or removing SCOM management servers in SCOM 2019 is the question. Installing or removing? 
Well, you must mm -hmm. make sure that there's no SCOM agent installed on that machine before you start installing a SCOM management server on it. Mm -hmm. That actually happened a few times and uh, that doesn't work. Um, but for the rest, there's no, yeah, no, not, not much specific yep. things. And, and just for removing, yeah, make sure that once you remove it, that it's also removed from SCOM uh, through the other management servers, which are still there. Distance to the database, or not physical distance, but time would mm -hmm. also be one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft wants the management servers to be local to the database. So yeah. if you're gonna, if you're thinking of installing a management server in a remote site, it just won't work well because of latency. So that's yeah. one. I don't know the the milliseconds off the top of my head, but you'll want to check to see that it's very quick to get to SQL when you're mm. five. 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 That's that's land speed basically. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, they're 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 supposed to be in the same data center. Uh, gateways would be your option. I think we'll talk about that a little later. But if you need something mm -hmm. to compress data remotely, yeah, I did mm -hmm. see a question relating to that somewhere. Sounds we will hit good. that uh, in a minute. Indeed. I'm thinking that's probably the, a good place to go next. Uh, the next question that's in in the Q and A chat is is one that was pre-submitted, so I'm going to actually uh, not answer that question right now because it's it's covered in the slides that are coming up. Um, but what I will say before we move on to the questions that were sent through is there's another opportunity for live questions at the end. So if anything comes to mind while you're listening to today's uh, webinar please do continue to put them uh, in the Q&A. Also, the Slack workspace is back up. My phone is now lit up with lots of uh, Slack notifications, so that's good. So you can uh, use the Slack workspace, which is at scomathon.com forward slash Slack to submit uh, more long-lived questions if things occur after today's webinar. So let's dig through the questions that were submitted earlier now. Um, essentially, the first one is from Brian. How do you fix the data warehouse failed to deploy reports for a management pack to SQL reporting server, services server, when you're running SQL 2016 and don't have the same option as SQL 2019. That's from Brian, as I said. Guys, what are your thoughts? Let Bob cover this one. All right, yeah, so I was thinking about this. So I do see that the question seems to relate to SQL 2016. Now, normally if you have SQL 2017 or 19, which I think Brian is also uh, alluding to. We see this occurring because of the allowed resource extensions for upload setting. Um, it's a new setting since uh, SQL 2017. And we need to add a star dot star there or every specific uh, extension that our reports can have. However, before that time, we also sometimes saw this happening depending on some of the management packs you were using. So for example, the SharePoint 2013 management pack or NLB 2012 or RDS 2012. And they usually, ha they had some references in there which cannot be converted. So that basically, because they are not there and then it gives the error. And But the error should state which pack is actually causing the issue. And the option would be to first remove that management pack, wait a day, check if all of the other reports are loading and working fine. And then next try to add that pack again and see uh, what's happening and of course make sure that you have the latest version of these kind of management packs mm. because yeah if bugs are fixed then you want the versions with the bug fixes yeah makes total sense makes total sense all right hopefully that answers your question brian uh let's move on to question number two pre-submitted um from prema how can i modify the default alert descriptions to be more meaningful this one comes up so many times yeah Hello, what do you think I, unfortunately, it's going to be some bad news here that the default descriptions are sent with the management pack and they are fixed in there. Uh, you can, as the alerts come out, there are a couple options. And I think there was even one for PowerShell in the last Scamathon where you could trigger a PowerShell script and then you could extract it and make your own and either send it via HTML or a different method. But as for an option to directly override the description on an alert, mm -hmm. there's nothing built into SCOM. So you're going to have to be doing that as a, an after the fact, after it fires, and then whether it's another tool or a script written by yourself. Yeah. No clean yeah. And usually here. the initial description is quite short in most cases. 
but there is more information in the alert itself by opening the properties of the alert, the context, the health explorer, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Makes sense. I have a very, very vague recollection of uh, possibly a Kevin Holman management pack that does something uh, akin to what Nathan was saying. Somebody did it Scomathon with PowerShell. Um, I could I be think wrong. List something also made a, a management pack. Mike was it Mike Liss at Scomathon? John Liss, uh, John Liss list. from List Productions yeah. has, has a paid for add-on uh, MP for SCOM essentially that will will do this. It also adds, I think, the knowledge, um, which is is quite useful. Um, all right, so that's that one. Uh, next question is also from Prema. Uh, when all management service resource pool is unavailable, most occurrences due to health service stops. Is there any way, to, uh, any smart way that health service can be automatically restarted when this alert is raised by SCOM? Thoughts panel. Mm. Right. I would I would say this normally doesn't occur, right? So fixing the issue is I think the most important part of this. However, what we have done in the past at times is to use some form of automation, such as for example, System Center Orchestrator, to check the services running on SCOM management servers. So basically to monitor the monitor and then mm. restart them if they go down and maybe in a loop of three times and after it fails that three times, then just send an email out. Um, obviously this is aside from the window setting for where you can have window services automatically restart after a few minutes, for example, that would also very well help. But, you know, make sure that the all management service resource pool is always or nearly always up um, because this is running so many things in the background uh, for SCOM that you really need this one to stay up. Yeah. And I just and double on that first sentence that Bob had mentioned that health service stopping shouldn't occur very frequently at all. So you probably want to chase to the bottom of that mm. and go from there. There are some plasters yeah. or bandages you could put over to, to bring it back up quicker, but there's likely something deeper that needs to be addressed. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, and we will discuss that later on as well. Yeah, as we alluded to earlier, you know, all management service resource pool is down equals SCOM is dead, no dice. So, um, you know, and it shouldn't happen. Therefore, if it is happening, uh, dig into why rather than try and stick a plaster over the top of it. That will be better longer term. All right, next one up is from Matthias. Uh, now and then the agent service stops working. Is there any way to automatically restart the agent service or notifying somewhere, uh, someone where SCOM admins don't have admin rights on the agent machines? What do you guys think? So I think, so we do have an alert, right? So when, when a health service goes down, we have the health service watcher, which is the management server. And um, if it misses three heartbeats of the agent, it will issue a health service heartbeat failed alert and it creates a notification for that. So you could, you know, notify based on that one. Of course, on the agent side, you could set the Windows uh, service again to restart after failure. Um, but you cannot use scom itself directly i mean not not the agent because the agent is down so you cannot use the agent to restart itself um but it might be good to have a look at an article from kevin and i think it's being posted right now by nathan in the slack channel as well uh, which talks about the health service restarts so this also is something which happens very often and it basically means that there's yeah too many workflows running or um, something else happening and then the agent will restart itself the whole day and that's mm. something you don't want happening either indeed makes sense makes sense any other thoughts nathan anything to add before we um, uh, move on no just to, i guess call it the one we both bob and i had talked about this a little before aren't as concerned with a regular agent going down as a management server so it it may and yeah just check out kevin holman's blog but since it's a single agent, it's less systemic than the management yeah. server service staffing. Yeah. 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 Makes total sense. 
All right, pushing on then. Next question is from Jamie. We've been experiencing database performance issues with TempDB growing fast and becoming inaccessible. We think we fixed it by turning off a bunch of performance counters, but this was not easy to find. Are there any MPs or tools that can be used to find irregularities or bottlenecks in ESCOMDB? Is having a shared SQL instance running on a SQL availability group fit for purpose for SCOM? Two questions for the price of one there, guys. Um, dig in, please. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Jamie. So I would say that for the first part, to get really to get to the root of this, it will require some investigation uh, because there are multiple, you know, multiple possibilities and options there which could cause this. Um, I would say also think about the health check, something which we will talk about later in the session. But this is like really important to uncover a lot of things and to find uh, what's going on on the SQL layer as well, but also tuning, data churn and config churn, which will affect the SQL side of things. In general, I would advise to keep SCOM databases on separate SQL instances when no other databases are located for other products. Um, this is due to the performance and the very busy nature of these databases and the use of the TempDB by these databases. So they are both the SCOM database and the SCOM data warehouse, they are hitting the TempDB hard. So, you know, that's uh, very important. Nathan? Yeah, and that TempDB is going to be shared with your other items on there. So SQL is going to pull into that if you do something like a Cartesian join, and it's going to use the TempDB to hold part of that. So it could also be whatever is else is on there is using up a large section of that tempdb as well so there'll be some picking out of a inside of tempdb to see what's using it and see from there yeah i would take not not host uh scom databases preferably not together with anything but uh otherwise maybe only with like with a orchestrator database or something like that which is also a system center product and I so think that is my support line as well. Yeah, if you make a call into them, that's what you're going to get as a like. Yeah, yeah. If you mm. put it together with, for example, a service manager databases, those are also busy and they are also basically built on top of SCOM. So that yeah, that will also hit the TMDB again. So keep that in mm. mind. Mm -hmm. There's a, another tip relating to this from Mike Sargent. Hello, Mike. Uh, in the in the Q and A relating to this, never put SCOM and SQL on the same machine. Always put SQL on a separate machine. Wise words. The only place we 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 do this is in our lab, basically, because it's yeah. uh, it's a recipe to single box for, lab is the deal. Yeah, well, you're trying to save those pennies on an Azure um, hosted uh, piece of infrastructure. <laughs> Essentially, sound, sound advice panel, sound advice all. And also, Nathan, I learned a new word, Cartesian. So there we go. Today's yes. uh, is a good day all around. Um, thank oh, you. Moving on. The next one is a very long, uh, long question from Steve here. Uh, and that's because there's a script in the middle, essentially. A set, the gist is um, snapshot synchronization failures from a management server that is 10 milliseconds round chips worth of latency away from the database. And the nub of the question is, is there a more direct way other than running this script to force synchronization on the management server? Now, obviously attendees, you can read this, uh, uh, Nathan and uh, Bob, you've already had this and had a chance to chew over this, so I don't need to read this yeah. to you. What are your thoughts? Well, actually, I had a I had a long answer, but uh, <laughs> we can uh, we can make that a little bit shorter. But um, so it it looks like you need to refer back to manual snapshot syncs uh, and adjusting config file settings. But uh, it looks like it has to do with some differences between your management servers because it looked like two management servers are doing what they should do and one doesn't. And I'm guessing that's the one which is 10 milliseconds round trip away. Um, keep in mind that you want to keep your management servers close to the database no matter what, preferably under five milliseconds. So even if you place them in a different data center, then it should still be under five milliseconds. And if there are two working, this makes me believe that um, this extra management server, this third management server is maybe done for a recovery scenario, but it could also be that it is meant to be placed closer to the agents. 
and just placing a management server closer to the agent is really not the best solution if you want to have a contact point closer to the agents then put a gateway there so this is a common scenario and we do cover it in our scum admin training as well if you want to solve this in your current situation i would do this workaround so this workflow is run by the old management service resource pool there it is again bruce yeah. um which by default includes all management servers so it's not that they all need to run this workflow just one of them is running it at that time but mm -hmm. what you could do is change the membership of the of that resource pool to manual and then put only the two fast management servers in there and then you still have you know a failover between the two and then you can just leave the third management server out of this thing and then it doesn't mm -hmm. try to run this uh, the synchronous snapshot synchronization job also mm -hmm. keep in mind to be very careful to with the editing of config files with these settings and also to keep them the same on every management server because if they you know deviate uh, from each other then that's a recipe for uh, for bad luck what could possibly go wrong many things it, I, I would think <laughs> makes sense yes. Many gateways things. i had thought of but what i hadn't thought of bob and your answer was uh, resource pool adjustments it makes total sense they yeah yeah it's a it's a config way. service yeah the config service is really just a worker that pulls its work from the database so mm -hmm. there's not other than like some of these config settings there's not a lot that's local to the management server so it is really probably looking to see what your differences are between those because they just take mm -hmm. turns pulling down the workload and performing it Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and it could be that you need to rethink your um, your design basically with the three management servers, especially if there are two in one data center and one in another. It will it will never be able to to survive the uh, failure in the first data center. Mm -hmm. So then the third mm -hmm. one will be down anyway. Wait, so wait, actually deliver what it was intended to deliver. Yeah. Yeah makes sense um just to quickly say before we move on to the next question uh, this the questions are starting to come in sort of live again in in the chat uh, just so you know i'm i'm not i'm not ignoring them we're gonna we're gonna come back to them at the end um we're going to leave some time for them at the end i'm going to get through some yeah. of these ones that were present in first and i get the feeling we're going to have more questions than we have time to cover which is no bad thing and i'll talk about what the answer to that is at the end moving on then next question is from nolan how can i author windows service monitoring for specific computers go panel go yeah i can grab grab this one it's a good news unlike the the email one i grabbed earlier the notification and description one so there is a uh, template in the authoring pane for service monitoring which works well and to get the specific computers nolan mentions here you're just going to want to start with an unsealed management pack and create a group beforehand so that you can put those computers in and during the authoring template, you'll be asked like for a group to target. You just pick your your group with explicit membership and it will target just those computers. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty easy, all done through the SCOM UI. No crazy XML or anything required and it should work as desired. Always good. A few minutes and you're up and running. This is like one of my favorite templates. Perfect. Nice, easy one to answer. Moving on then. <clears throat> Will SCOM ever have an out of the box solution for customer that description in case of authoring? Well, Manish, uh, I think this is a question for Akash and the SCOM product team. Uh, there is a forum, uh, the replacement for user voice uh, that the SCOM product team do take feedback from. So I would propose you pose this one to Akash and the SCOM product team and we've We've covered essentially how you how you handle customer alert descriptions already. Unless my panel have anything to add, I'm going to move on. No, I think that's the that's the main the main the main gist of it. And of course, there is authoring tools for it. So indeed, yeah. indeed. Sounds good. All right, moving on then to the next question, which is also on the Slack channel, which I'll just put a quick plug in for. Now, Slack is alive again. Um, if you go to scumathon.com forward slash Slack, you can put longer lived questions than the ones I'm just reading from GoToWebinar. And that's always available to you. But this, this one came in via that, that method. This is a question from Blake here, essentially. Uh, or oh, do I want to read this one? Scum our, our old friend, Blake. Very our old good. friend, 
Blake indeed. He he's known to us through many 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 conferences and uh, and uh, many events. <laughs> um, so the question is: Scom 2012 R2 AD 2008 MP that has dependencies on AD 2K and AD 2K3. A former AD dude created custom MP that leverages these legacy 2K8 MPs, then created some custom override MPs as well. I'm trying to decouple and get all the custom 2K8 AD perf monitors, etc. And I've been hacking the XML. It's daunting. Uh, override creator and explorer are tools that exist. They look like they should be good, but honestly, they don't seem to work. Am I missing some framework on the server? I don't have SCOM reporting. I, sum I summarized hacking the XML is the only way to get all of this cleaned up. Are there any thoughts? Go back. Yes, I will, uh, I will pick up this one. Um, so let's starting with one of the things at the end. I would say you should always have SCOM reporting to work with SCOM, even not if it, uh, if it is uh, for, your, uh, for your other users, but also for yourself as a SCOM admin, because there are many useful reports and features in there. Um, jumping to the override explorer. Um, so override explorer works in most cases to move some overrides from one pack to another. Sometimes it doesn't work. It will not cover all scenarios. I actually did a webinar for the Scomathon workshop in 2020, um, which is there. And Nathan is already pasting the, the link to it. There's a recording of it. And, uh, this actually covered more than just the Override Explorer, but uh, please have a look at that uh, session. I think it has a lot of cool stuff in it, and actually also the um, the Easy Tune presented uh, by somebody else than Bruce. <laughs> That's also That's a fun really part. Yeah. People are sick um, of hearing me talk. <laughs> yeah, but indeed the 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 many references from custom monitoring packs and Override packs to those old management packs, right? Which you previously, which you obviously want to get rid of, they are usually a problem. So many references will turn out empty, so they can be manually removed. So yes, that's already hacking in XML a little bit, but the rest is trying to find out what monitoring actually got created and see if it still applies to the new management packs. Mm. Since the Active Directory management pack for 2016 and up, which actually does cover 2012 domain controllers as well has been completely rewritten so all the classes are different and that's why also the overrides will not work anymore because you need to retarget all of the overrides and even find out if the monitor or rule that you're overriding is still there because that also changed a lot mm -hmm. um, and otherwise it's reverse engineering what that custom monitoring part was and recreating it in a fresh management pack and I must say, we often find ourselves hacking the XML when removing old management pack with a lot of references or while migrating to another SCOM setup or a newer side-by-side -side migration and needing to get rid of an, a lot of old management packs at the same time. So yeah, in that case, you do end up with the Notepad++ or whatever version you are looking uh, for. And uh, yeah, it's, it is a little bit daunting, but it's very doable in the end. Just depends yeah. on what you are moving. And you'll see some similar things like this on the SQL MPs where they've changed yes. design over the years. And just to, personally from the experiences I've had, sometimes it's easier to just start knowing that you're gonna need to refactor things. I've tried to take and copy over the old to the new and it, it just always ends up like a mess of spaghetti tangled and they're not there or the structure is different. Mm -hmm. um, although it's daunting, I, I think my suggestion would be just to start and think, I'll use the old one for a reference, but I'm going to have to look at it from the new design down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And otherwise, just contact us and uh, we'll see how to, how to help you uh, out there, Blake. Makes sense. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, yeah, as you say, um, Nathan, the, the structure of the MPs when they when they have made significant updates or rewritten them, same deal with AD, essentially ca can sometimes in the case of AD, there's quite a lot of workflows that were simply renamed. So, you know, if you were to use EasyTune to export to, X, uh, to CSV and then essentially do a find and replace, you'll get closer. But I think ultimately, as you say, Nathan, just yeah. start again. It's simpler. Um, so there we go. 
Moving on now, just going to keep an eye on the times. So we have time for live questions too. Uh, how a question now from Ian? How do I deal with IIS MP and web servers that have many websites and application pools? In an issue with the server, it creates a lots of alerts for all of the above. I what do you think? think I can do a somewhat quick answer on this one. So it hmm? it sounds like it's operating as designed because if there's an issue with the server and you have 50 websites, there are 50 websites down. Mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately does generate one server alert plus 50 website alerts plus probably a bunch more but the monitoring is accurate so one of the the ideas when bob and i were brainstorming you if you're using vms you could split to smaller web vms but that's kind of a major um, a major option additionally would be trying to get it in maintenance mode quick if you know the server issue is either predicted or like maybe this is actually from a change mm. maintenance mm. mode could be a good way to prevent this storm um, and then finally if you're looking at something like we had mentioned before using a powershell to handle your alerts or a, a more advanced system potentially trying to correlate and suppress the alerting on the the little um, the subsequent alerts to that mm -hmm. parent alert and I would also uh, add to that dashboarding. So if you have dashboarding to see only the relevant websites, for mm -hmm. example, going down and not for maybe a test website, which is on the same machine, then you can focus on what is really important for your business. Mm. Agree, couldn't agree more, in fact. Yeah, you could turn uh, off you could turn off alerting on the state-based monitors and just look at the state, because if you know you have a dashboard like bob says just go look at that instead of getting 60 alerts you'll just see a block mm -hmm. of red yes mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately sometimes that's all you care about so that would make your life much simpler makes sense moving on in the interest of time to a question from yang about uh, flapping alerts essentially uh is there an easy way to prevent flapping alerts is essentially the uh, question right so and there is actually some protection there since it is a rule and it should have suppression on it so you would only see one per server but it could be that it happens that there are different types of workflows coming in and then you might see multiple alerts uh, on a server but they should not be that many and there should be a repeat count on those um so you should only get one ticket per server if it happens and if you don't close the alert immediately uh, like automatically, then it uh, also just raises the repeat count on it. Keep in mind that these are built-in rules for the agent itself, and they do not have repeated event version of this. So you should look into what the failing script is as well in this case. Um, mm -hmm. The other, the only way to do exactly this, what you ask, is would be to create a new custom rule for repeated event detection. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Makes total sense, moving on. Um, is there an easy way to move a group or multiple groups from one MP to another, or do they need to be recreated? We're working on cleaning up uh, a leftover giant cluster management pack, and that's a question from Patrick. I can start this one. So it's gonna vary largely if it's unsealed to sealed. So if your clustered management pack that you're referring to here is an unsealed pack, everything those groups were used for so every workflow that targets them every override that targets them will also be in that unsealed pack so you're looking at moving quite a bit around and since it's unsealed if you move it things that were in the pack won't be able to target it and it it may just shake out to be a mess mm -hmm. um, if it was a sealed pack say you had a a major groups pack and you wanted to split it out to maybe two or three groups pack or maybe a groups by teams pack you should be able to move those but then again every unsealed management pack that targets that cluster pack will now need to be rewritten to target a new context of your new group pack group pack v2 mm -hmm. so there there isn't an easy way to move the group and everything included just moving the group wouldn't be so bad itself but it's it's the downstream effect that's really going to bite you here that the group was probably created for something so moving it everything that pointed to it is now needs to be updated as well mm. mm -hmm. that's the basic point 
So you're not just having a group for, you know, for its own sake. There's a lot of things might be connected to it, like monitors, rules, overrides, um, targeted monitoring, views, uh, notifications, yeah. you know, all kinds of stuff happening there. And if you need to move all of those over and their dependencies and the display strings, then yeah, it might be a lot. So it all mm. depends. It's messy. In summary, it's yeah. messy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Moving doable. on. All doable, all doable, just work and messy, potentially. Moving on uh, to a question from Santosh. Data drops due to maximum queue size increased, modified the registry settings, but that not does that does not help a lot. Question from Santosh. I can I can grab that one and talk to that one. Mm -hmm. So just in the back end on SCAM, when you've seen an author and you have your data sources, your probes, your write actions, and things that get passed between those go into a queue at one point. Mm -hmm. um, so you've probably got an issue somewhere where it's not consuming the data out quick enough, which could be a, a database write issue. It could be uh, an authentication issue. It could be a bunch of items. But mm. increasing the maximum size of the queue will give you longer before it fills. But if you aren't consuming data out of the queue at a rate at or faster than the data you're putting it in, you will always override that. So you, you're sense. probably going to want to look for a yeah a Windows error previous to this one a bit something about a workflow failed and see what's what's with that workflow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. All right. So, simple answer to say possibly more complicated to troubleshoot depends on the nature. Yeah, of the error. fortunately it's not a same before easy one. Yeah. So it, if you have an extremely busy one, upping that queue size can help. Like if you have spikes that come in, but if it's a sustained faster coming in than going out upping the queue is just going to delay the inevitable of it fills up so indeed yeah it yes. makes sense they're the two variables aren't they queue length and how quickly you're pulling things in the queue yeah. all right perfect the next one we've sort of touched on and let's see if there's anything extra to add here uh, what could be daily weekly and monthly health checks for database specifically from the jam I would look at uh, still at the uh, amount of config churn and data churn that you have to using a number of uh, default management packs, which are, are default management packs and default reports, which are there, like the ones built in from, from SCOM itself, the operations manager views, and the one from SCOM management from Kevin Holman, the ops manager self-maintenance one, which is now available through Cookdown as well for free. and um, yeah, and aside from that, uh, looking at the reports, and we actually do have a section on this story in our training. So, um, yeah, we can talk about that separately, but uh, it'll be there. So there's a lot of things that you can do on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, actually, to uh, help make SCOM better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Totally, totally. And uh, some of the things are the same regardless of whether it's daily, weekly or monthly, essentially. Um, um, perfect. Yep. Moving on. How can we automate the process of web URL monitoring addition slash removal from web application availability management pack template? Question from Saeed. But mm -hmm. I'll start on this one. So adding it and removing it specifically to the template will be difficult just the way the templates are modified from the UI. But we've got a couple blog posts, and I can try and link one in Slack later, where we discover dynamic data from either a CSV or another source. And you could potentially discover them from there, your URLs, and target it. So it would just be a discovery that runs every, say, 12 hours or every day, and it pulls in the new URLs, and then mm -hmm. your workflows would target that. So to directly answer it, I don't know if you could automate it very well through the UI, but automating this wouldn't be too bad to write a custom management pack in a class type of URL tested, and then you would just modify the code the UI created to target your new class type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that. Sense. Yeah, and maybe maybe if you want to really really automate it, then you might have a look at the XML that it actually creates when you create a new management pack, run this thing once, yeah. and see what, what it actually creates. But it, it might create a little bit more than you would like. 
but you could try and then you know replicate this for multiple uh, objects mm -hmm. makes yep. sense Makes sense. Perfect. Moving on. A uh, question from Thomas. Uh, once monitored servers didn't come out of maintenance mode automatically, even though I set up the time frame. Why? How can I prevent this from happening? I discovered this the hard way, essentially, when I had to tell uh, users, when users had to tell me the server is offline and SCOM didn't pick it up, essentially. Yeah. So keep them. So there, there were actually a few bugs in the past which got uh, ch fixed with uh, update rollups which actually had this. Um, so keep in mind to use the latest update rollup for SCOM in whatever version you are at. Um, sometimes it, it could also be due to the all management service resource pool being down for a while just in the middle of that maintenance mode. So it actually doesn't, doesn't pick up that, uh, that workflow. So the workflow which actually keeps an eye on the maintenance mode of other machines and taking it out of maintenance mode again is likely down at that moment and then you know you never know if it comes back up and if it uh, picks it up correctly uh, so keep an eye on that resource pool again and uh, yeah and also there are cases where it's also in double maintenance mode uh, through a, a secondary schedule and that's also a possibility so keep yeah. that in mind as well so there are multiple possibilities and yeah, finding things out the hard way is never nice, uh, Thomas. Indeed, never is, never is. I've seen the, the the double schedule thing before. We've got overlapping maintenance schedules and all of that. Such fun. All right, so that is all of the questions that were kind of pre-asked. There are a whole bunch that have come in uh, via the uh, Q&A that I will get to, I promise. Um, but one of the questions that's in there is, uh, speaking of health checks, do you recommend, and then there's a link to a GitHub repository, uh, Blake Drum's health check. Uh, so on health checks, I think this is a good point to jump to uh, a slide that we put together earlier predicting this, uh, which is all about health checks and where you can go to get a health check. There are actually two options uh, for health checks. In addition to the script that you've mentioned, George, in Slack, uh, Cookdown, we have one, and Bob, you from Topcore also have one. The Cookdown sure. one is free. Uh, our one is available at cookdown.com forward slash scon dash health dash check nice and intuitive url bob yours is a bit more expensive but than, uh, than free but obviously a lot more comprehensive than what we'll do for free um and yours is at topcore.com forward slash services forward slash scom dash health dash check dash check um, our one the cookdown one is scripts driven so we essentially send you a script that you can run in your environment it will give you pointers on what to kind of look for and uh, you will send this script back to us we'll have a look at it perform some analysis and essentially book an explanation meeting with you in which we'll run through the key points um, so it's free and it will get you going and if there's anything more detailed we'll typically refer you to bob and to his health check so bob i'll, I'll let you talk to uh, what your health right. check will do yeah, so our SCOM health check is quite extensive. Uh, it has a lot of checks in there into all SCOM components for their implementation, configuration, and we are look for technical errors or improvements. And next, we also look into the monitoring processes and procedures in general, including the dashboarding, uh, training, ITIL processes and documentation, lifecycle management, and much more. And this results in a document of about 70 pages detailing results and discussion. Um, and we also have a discussion with the SCOM admins to talk about what has been found and how to solve those. And we also mm -hmm. include a management presentation. So if you click next once more, then you will see that it's a three day engagement and one more click um, that we are delivering a very quite extensive and long document uh, with a lot of details in it. And also all things that we did check as well and we found to be good. So that's also an important mm. part of this uh, this thing. And mm. uh, for that, all of that, uh, it's only uh, 3000 uh, euros. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. As you say, a lot more comprehensive than what you'll get with our one, but then our one is free ultimately. So, you know, um, there we are. Um, it's, uh, maybe maybe to answer the other question uh, there's one uh, indeed released also by blake uh, and uh i'm not mm. sorry, sorry uh yes evans and yeah, um it is yeah blake so it is uh, available 
online and what it also does is it also dumps a lot of information through you know some powershells it's 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 a little bit more extensive as the one that that you have but it's a, some kind of a similar type of script um and uh yeah it also gives a lot of information um placed in a html overview uh, mm -hmm. but then it doesn't really talk about you know how to solve it or what you are actually looking at yep. and that is basically the difference of what we do so it's uh it, there's yeah. consultancy around it basically right so essentially that's the the information that will give you is great but you need to be able to interpret that information and know yes. what action to take and that is the difference between here is a script and here is a script plus some assistance which is kind of the cook down approach uh through to your approach bob which is a lot more sort of consultative and a lot more in depth um so that is is sort of is health checks i think um the other thing that we've sort of alluded to quite a few times through today, through today's webinar is the, the topic of training essentially it's worth mm. getting trained up in scom it's clearly a very deeply technical product there are lots of things that can happen that could go wrong there are lots of uh, ways of getting it to perform as good as it can for you and training is vital obviously you're here today so you've found scomathon already congratulations lucky you so you're aware of our free webinars events and blogs already it's worth having a look at our back catalog of topics and uh, video content and blogs from past con conferences we're just gearing up for scomathon our annual conference 2022 which will be on the nice. 10th of may so do go and check that out and register today where you'll find a lot more of the same. Uh, we have typically 16 hours worth of scommy content for you every year. And, um, you know, we have some great stuff there and we're working currently on our content hub to allow you to more easily surface the uh, backdated content from previous events and previous webinars. And it's all free. Nothing on Scomathon requires a sign up apart from the webinars themselves and all of that. So that's one place to go. Next place is obviously Top Core. Bob, I'll leave you to talk to these. Yes. So um, we also do a lot of uh, free webinars, blogs, etc. Um, a number of those are together with Scomathon, obviously, as you know, and what, this is one of those. Um, but we also have an official SCOM training, which is split up into three areas. The first one is the SCOM operator training. So how should you consume SCOM monitoring tool as well? Um, because there, there was never a uh, an operator training out there. There used to be some administrator trainings out there, but nobody ever explained how to use SCOM as an operator. And well... Given the amount of operators, there are usually about 10 or 20 or more operators to one SCOM admin. So it is important to have people understand what, what you, they're actually looking at in the SCOM console. And then next, we have the administrator training, which gives a deeper understanding of how SCOM works and how to get the best from, uh, from it. Also discussing these daily things, also the design items, uh, installation, agents best practices reporting etc etc there's a lot of information in there and next we will have the specialist trainings which are focused deep dive trainings on an area so maybe complex infrastructures or creating a management pack the easy way or creating management packs the hard way <laughs> i call it um but yeah we we have several different uh, topics there and we are working on more content uh, on that side but uh, the operator training and administrator training we are generally giving every month at a low cost the first one is about 100 euros or 145 us dollars and the administrator is uh, 1100 euros excluding taxes so about what is it uh, below 1600 uh, us dollars for a mm -hmm. three-day training mm -hmm. sounds so that good is, uh, yeah. And it is worth getting training if uh, SCOM is your bread and butter or in any way involved in your life, um, because ultimately, you know, there's a lot to it and a lot that you can learn uh, to get more from it. Um, just to say before I continue with the slides, we're almost at time. Uh, if you still have questions, please do continue to submit them to the Q&A and obviously to Slack. We will get there at the end. If you hang on, I'll, if you're still on the on the webinar at the end after I go through the obligatory slides, then we will get to your questions live still, I promise. Um, but first, another thing that's important to say is where you can go to get help. Um, there obviously are consulting type options, but there aren't you know, there's some options that are not consulting based. So Squared Up run a platform called Community Answers, which is like a forum 
and people post questions in there about Squared Up, obviously, uh, but also about SCON more broadly, and it's intended for that purpose. That's a place you can go. Uh, on Facebook, there is the System Center Operations Manager Facebook group, intuitively named. And while uh, it's on Facebook, that might be a, a thing that puts you off for some people. Uh, there are a large number of active users uh, in that group, I think from memory three and a half thousand. I know Bob, you're active in there, certainly. Mm -hmm. I'm in there too. Um, you can get your questions of a technical nature answered there. I should have put a slide for the uh, Scomathon Slack channel because uh, that always is is alive and lives forever. You can always post questions there. There is the uh, System Center Tech Community page. Now this is important because if you have any feedback for the Scom product group, they actually look at this. So if you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see in Scom or what you'd like Scom to do more of, post it here. A cache and the Scom product team actively look at this. We frequently have discussions with them around bits of feedback that have come in. Um, so a vital resource for improving Scom. And of course, Top Core, you guys can help uh, if you're looking to go down the more consultive route. Um, so there's that to say as well. Uh, on the next slide, Bob, I will let you talk to this slide. Yeah, so at Top Core, we also have a community uh, badges program, aside from our uh, certification badges, as you now know. And the community badges, they are free. They usually have to do with webinars that we organize or that we participate in where we basically know where to issue a badge. So if you have registered to this session uh, and attended it using a real name, which can be tracked back to you, then we can actually issue you the uh, this badge using the name and email address that you provided. And we will get to that uh, very soon together with uh, Blue, Bruce and the organization behind uh, the Scomaton. So mm. keep your eye on this. Um, there will be an email coming in uh, from a platform called Badger, Bad GR, and uh, it might come in your uh, junk mailbox. So keep an eye on that as well, because sometimes it's seen as junk, but uh, it's actually a real uh, message in that case. Mm hmm. Sounds good. And I can confirm, Bob, good news from scrolling down the attendees. There aren't any of the devil at hotmail.com that I can see at a glance. So that's good as far as badge issuing is concerned. Um, Very so, good. And you see them. <laughs> always good. So I've got a few uh, ad slides to go through, just mentioning the sponsors of this, of this uh, webinar series. And then we'll get to your live questions for those of you who are still on the call. So just a mention of Cookdown, who you will have heard of by now, because we've talked about Cookdown a few times. In addition to what we've already talked about, we make code-free integrations for SCOM to allow you to connect SCOM uh, to anywhere uh, that you want to connect it to from pushing its alerts into ITSM tools like ServiceNow and ShareWell, through into messaging platforms like Slack and Teams, and ultimately uh, via any way you like, via the power of the webhook, the powerful webhook. Uh, but also if you want to get things into SCOM to raise alerts in SCOM, uh, we also provide uh, products to do that as well. Again, via webhook, ultimately any platform that can send uh, an eventy alerty type message via webhook, we can consume that and we can raise those things as alerts in SCOM. Everything you need to know is at cookdown.com where you can take a free trial of everything that I've talked about. You can see demos and ultimately ask us any questions that you like. Uh, there's no representation from our next sponsor on today's webinar, so I'll take this one. Um, so Squared Up are obviously the not so secret source for SCOM success. And what do they do? They provide a dashboard that will sit on top of SCOM and of course all of your other tools to provide the single pane of glass that can make you uh, succeed successful with SCOM ultimately, go beyond simply consuming alerts to really understanding what at SCOM is capable of, and of course, all the other tools that make up your at SCOM deployment. And then we have Top Core for today only. Bob, I'll let you take this Ooh. slide. So mm -hmm. let me just shortly introduce ourselves. So Top Core is an IT consultancy based in the Netherlands with a team members spread across several countries and delivering consultancy services to customers of all sizes and verticals with a specialization in Microsoft monitoring and management tooling. We are most well known for our SCOM services. So some of our main services are listed right here, being a SCOM health check to view and confirm the current status of your SCOM environment. We have SCOM trainings at different levels from operator to admin to specialist. And of course, our community efforts also fall in this pillar. 
And we have next the third pillar, which are SCOM implementations, migrations, upgrades, and extending your monitoring and dashboarding. And yes, we also use uh, Squared Up for that. And our fourth pillar is the maintenance as a service to help you keep your monitoring environment running and healthy, or what also falls under this uh, category is getting regular support and knowledge mentoring from our side during those hours. So you could also say, hey, I'm not giving you access to my environment, but I want you to be there for four hours uh, a month to answer my questions and help me uh, on my journey forward. And mm -hmm. uh, we also provide that service as well underneath the maintenance uh, column there. So okay. those are the main points, uh, Bruce. And I guess everything you need to know for, for Top Core is at topcore.com. And so yes, exactly. Further ado, we will go back to any final questions for uh, us, essentially. And woo, I've just flicked through the slides rather than through the questions. So let me just go back to the questions. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there are a number of questions. Um, I'll answer them in the order they came in uh, for people who are still on the webinar. So uh, the first question, which we haven't already answered, is do you know if there's a PowerShell script or report which would look at all alerts generated and determine if there's any confidential information on the alert? That's from George. Are you aware of such a thing? Oh, I think the more difficult, I mean, you can pull the data from all the alerts. It would be identifying what is confidential. Mm. Yeah, so as far as I know, I as far as I know, almost nothing in, in SCOM is really confidential information looking at alert uh, descriptions, those kind of things, because you are monitoring infrastructure and not, let's say, database entries, except mm -hmm. when you are using APM. If you are using the APM component, then you can pull up fields which are considered uh, confidential, such as social security numbers or credit cards. And there are actually filters in the product there where you can filter them out. And mm -hmm. then an administrator or a dev cannot actually see the contents of those fields um, being dragged through Scrum. So mm -hmm. in that case, uh, they will be hidden. I've come across companies who would consider anything to do with uh, machine name or domain information to be confidential. Mm -hmm. And obviously by virtue of what SCOM does, an alert is generated by something that's being monitored. <clears throat> so stripping all of that information out would be key there. Um, I'm not aware of a PowerShell script that will do it, but it should be relatively easy to script up, I would have thought. Um, well, also if you strip out that information, then I don't know what you're going to do with the alerts in that case because right. they are there to be able to fix uh, things on those machines. Yeah. 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 All right, so that's the first question. Next one in the list. Uh, when updating any rule overrides, it invokes all agents' discovery process. It's very harmful because SCOM agents' database is killing storage. We've got 1,000 plus agents. <clears throat> and it's happening every hour until night. How do I force it to not start discovery at that situation? Um, so, so updating an override will cause a config churn, which will cause discoveries to run. But then the every hour part, I'm trying to get my head around. You can schedule mm -hmm. discoveries and you can set a sync time or an interval, which you could override. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't, mm -hmm. if it's not set to run every hour, it shouldn't rerun every hour. If it is, I'd say take a look at the article we posted from Kevin Holman. If your agent's restarting because it's hitting a resource utilization, on start, any discovery without a sync time will run. So you could potentially be hitting that, forcing a restart, running your discovery, um, and something like that. The other one is if you have frequent state changes, or uh, sorry, frequent property changes, those will cause downstream discoveries to run. So if you've done some sort of custom discovery to pull, say, a date onto your computer field, which would, would be unadvisable, but if that discovery updated the computer field every hour, every computer downstream would rerun each potential discovery that could be impacted. So you could create a cascade there as well. Mm. Yes. Makes sense. The final thing I was just going to add is essentially uh, config 
config churn is, is only generated where the override applies to that agent. So if you were to uh, you know, apply your overrides to groups where possible, uh, rather than sort of globally, uh, you would prevent some of the impacts from those overrides potentially. But yeah, if an agent work. moves in and out of a group, it doesn't globally reapply the monitoring. It only impacts the agent moving. However, if you change any management pack, you will trigger a global. Yes, but true. Yeah, if you, true, can, true. if you can apply it to a group for frequently changing agents, you'll gain some performance benefits there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Moving on. Next question. If there are two management servers in the all, resource, all management resource pool and one management server is going there and one management server goes down and the agents are not get, not failing over assuming that the other management server is working correctly then what can be the problem so essentially two servers in a resource pool one server goes down then the agents aren't failing over to the second management server so keep in mind that windows agents don't care about resource pools at all the only things connected to a resource pool uh, monitoring is network devices and Linux devices or Unix Linux monitoring, um, but not the Windows agents. So Windows agents generally um, go back and wait for a while until the management server go, uh, comes back online and then it will try to reach any other available management server if it is configured to do so. And norm by default it does. However, if it's sitting behind a gateway or if it's like a very specifically hard coded in uh, management server, then you would have to give it a failover management server. For example, if you are behind a gateway and you have two gateways, then you will have to specify to the agent which gateways it can actually use and talk to. So keep that in mind as well. Also, if you are behind firewalls and it can reach one management server, but it cannot reach the other one, then it would still try it once and then it will fail that one as well. And then it will just wait for the original management server to come back up online. So that's mm. also something which I have seen forgotten in some type, some cases. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, next question from Jonathan. Uh, this one's an interesting one. It's more a meta one than a technical one. What do you think is the reason why SCOM is not as popular as other solutions on the market? Oh, I'm going to start by taking this one to say uh, what we've seen from the big SCOM survey data is people run SCOM alongside other monitoring tools. And it's not a case of kind of what one monitoring tool to rule them all. And we typically see people deploy SCOM alongside other tools and they'll use whatever tool is best to breed for the thing they're trying to monitor. So if you're trying to monitor networking, we talked about earlier, um, you may consider SolarWinds over SCOM. But if you've got uh, anything that's Microsofty and uh, is infrastructure, SCOM is best to breed, you know, so um, it would make sense to use it. Um, so it's not a case of it's not as popular as it's a case of picking the right tool for the right use case is what I would say. Panel, mm -hmm. any additional thoughts? Yeah, I would say also that it has to do with scaling, right? So if you are like a very small shop, like, a, I don't know, 50 servers or something like that, you would likely not put in something with a heavy footprint such as SCOM because let's be honest it is a, a heavy application uh, looking at the databases and the management servers um, but also keep in mind that um, back in the day a lot of years ago they decided to bring back uh, the licensing from just one product into all products in one which mm. actually made sense if you were using three or more of the products but if you are using only one of the products, then actually the price went up. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a system center license now. And mm -hmm. uh, that for some companies actually made a difference because they were only using one product and then mm -hmm. they just uh, optioned, uh, opted out, let's say. But mm -hmm. if you are using more uh, of these products or you are actually getting a lot of value from the product, which is, well, something which you are in the business of and we are also in the business of, as uh, top core and uh, cook down uh, to bring more value out of these products uh, themselves you know and then uh, then it will be actually be more uh, more popular and i think that that is the whole problem people thinking that you know if you use a free tool that it doesn't cost like a million hours to actually configure it the way you want it to and then also you still might not have the flexibility and the possibilities that uh, this great tool called SCOM has. 
It's very true. I remember back in the day when I first got into IT using a tool called Big Brother for basically up down monitoring. And uh, for, for us at the time, this was sort of 2003, it, it was the right tool again for the right job. We were a small shop, you know, we were sort of possibly 200 agents worth of service, I would say. And, and it kind of worked for us back then. But as the company grew, we were actually looking at SCOM because um, it was the right tool for the right job. And um, yes. Perfect. Uh, let's see, what else have we got? Uh, what's the real cause of the below alert? PowerShell script failed to run, workflow initialization failed. These are very common alerts and are noisy, but we never get a root cause for this type of alert. Please, can you suggest an answer? PowerShell Easy. initialization failed? Uh, PowerShell script failed to run, workflow initialization failed is the alert. I would I guess, guess it's lack of resources on the box. PowerShell doesn't, it actually runs inside of a module, assuming you're running, when did that start? 16 or later, it doesn't actually run the script on the side. And if there's not enough resources, it won't load up and launch the script. So you might want to check on the box if anything, if it is at that heavy of a level that SCOM is not running, running those scripts would be my first guess. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes there are some scripts which are, you know, uh, which have some bugs or which are older if you have older management packs, and then they might also refuse to run. And actually, I can say that last week we published an update to the scheduled tasks management pack, which we are maintaining uh, since the last few years for Raphael. And uh, we just published a, an update to that one, which actually did create an, uh, an error on one of the uh, discoveries and uh, and one of the uh, collection rules. So that actually uh, got fixed. So, you know, those kind of things also happen. And uh, yeah, there might be some common management packs and common scripts which always fail or fail more regularly. And then you can troubleshoot those uh, accordingly, I would say. Then you can be more specific. Definitely, definitely. And finally, you know, you, you mentioned in your question, uh, noisy. These are very common alerts and are noisy. If ultimately these aren't being, if these aren't useful to you, and you feel after performing some of the steps that um, you know Bob and, and Nathan have mentioned that these alerts are not adding value to you, the people that are consuming them are just being annoyed by them. Turn them off. <laughs> if they're not, if they're not generating any value, then don't waste time on them. Simply, there are many other things. It's, it's better to have people engaged in the alerts SCOM is generating that are delivering value than to just basically annoy people and have people disengage from SCOM altogether because of this one mm. thing. Um, so turn them off. Is what I would suggest yeah. if uh, you can't find the root cause. Final question, unless some come in. Um, this one is from Santosh. Agent going into grayed out state due to health service. EDB got full. I did some registry settings like maximum queue size to oh, one. Oh, what is that? 102400 and persistent version store. Yeah, 100 meg. It's just I figured that out in my head. <laughs> um, and persistent version store to maximum of 5120. Uh, but that does not help and servers getting into grayed out state and dropping the data. Uh, oh, was this the same user that had the? Uh... Um, data full workflow. Yes. Yes. The same. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. whatever's consuming the data. That that EBD file is just a JET database, and that's where the data is going to live until it gets consumed. Um, in a real pinch, you can crack open the JET database and look and see what's in there, but that's not really advisable. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Your best yeah, your best bet is to see what what is not consuming the data sent to it. So hopefully there's some other errors in the logs of those servers. There should but be some, some errors yeah. there. I would recommend a health check, Santosh, if you're still on. Because <laughs> um, yeah, you know, ultimately the answer will be there in SCON more than likely, and it's a case of figuring it's out. It's going to be there in, yeah, one of them. That's true, but mm -hmm. you know, it's these kind of things could be very difficult. Uh, but it, it yeah. also it all depends on the situation, but also on what type of server it is. Because we have seen servers where, which are like huge hosting 200 databases on SQL, for example, which actually have so many workflows running that the SCOM agent actually gives up 
so it fills up and then it gives up and then it starts again and then it starts filling up again and then you know it goes into that eternal loop um mm -hmm. and so yeah there are things you can do about it in that case but you will know if a server is let's say very big in number of workflows the number of things that it does and then if scum monitors all of those things then uh it may, might need to beef up that agent mm -hmm. makes sense all right and this is the final question for today if your question hasn't been answered please go and post it on slack um also we have uh at the Scomathon event in, on the 10th of May, we'll be running another instance of these clinics with uh, potentially different panelists uh, in which you get another chance to get your questions answered live. And of course, all the steps we've given you, get a health check, get training, all the places you can go and get support will be at, that will be listed in the slides and we'll obviously put up on the Scomathon blog. So the final question with that in mind of today is, what are the most common causes and troubleshooting steps for notification and subscription issues? That's from Senda. Um, okay. I the one cause that comes to mind for me is uh, making subscriptions that are too wide or too narrow. I remember when I used to do those. If you, they're easy to make a mistake and send out way too many alerts, or miss if you're picking like if you think like oh it's actually this rule, well that may be the collection rule not the alerting rule. I would. At least from my experience, that was the most common one I'd run into is not getting the, the subscription set up right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very often, that there would also be alerts regarding uh, things going wrong in SCOM uh, coming from the management service or from the old management service resource pool or the notifications resource pool, actually, in this case. Um, also, keep in mind that uh, let's say you have an email channel going out um and you have two management servers then both might try to be sending out emails uh, to your email bridgehead and if only one of them is whitelisted and the other one is not then you would have failing uh, notifications as well so those kind of things might happen and we have actually seen that happen in the past or maybe it has some script where it connects to a web service and only one of the management servers has internet access or proxy access and the other one doesn't you know again that's uh, that will lead to the same kind of issues mm. uh, also you can run command channels uh, as a notification channel option but there are throughput limitations on those and if you put too many events through or you yes. have scripts that run too long you'll run into a bunch of issues there that it just doesn't process them quick enough or that the threads stay open mm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It's not meant, uh, meant to send out a thousand notifications in uh, in one minute, yeah. so it's uh, not built for that. Mm -hmm. I would say. Makes sense. Makes sense. All that's left to do then is to say thank you very much to all of you who are attending today for spending the time uh, with us today. And uh, I apologize for overrunning, but we wanted to get to all of those questions. If you have unanswered questions, go to scomathon.com forward slash slack and you can always put them in our Slack channel and all the other bits and pieces that we mentioned during the webinar is the place you can go and get help. Thank you, uh, Bob. Thank you, Nathan. I appreciate you joining me today and uh, for your, uh, your expertise and wisdom. Uh, final note for me is to keep an eye on scomathon.com for the next Coffee Break uh, webinar, which will be the third Tuesday of of March, I nearly said of April, <laughs> uh, where hopefully we'll have be having some exciting um, information from the SCOM product group. We have a few webinars lined up with them. So do keep an eye on that. I didn't trade it because uh, I can't talk about it yet, but just you know, keep an eye on that. That's all I'm saying. Um, and thank you very much everybody for attending and we will speak to you all again soon in another webinar. Thank you. Yep. Very good.